Hello, and welcome to episode six of the Bomb City Podcast. For this episode, I interviewed Kobe, creator of Church Magazine, Church Equipped Clothing, and Van Gogh, one of the nicest custom Econoline vans of all time. This interview was so much fun. We really got in deep and covered a ton of stuff, everything from hot rods to customs, drag racing, uh, art philosophy. Uh, it was a really fun interview. Kobe's such a talented designer and such a creative guy. It was really cool hearing how he comes to some of the decisions that he makes. So sit back and enjoy episode six, Kobe Church Magazine. Thank you so much for listening. This is definitely the most professional um, setup that we've uh, cobbled together so Y'all far. Y'all look like <laughs> professionals. Dang. <laughs> now we're just going to come up with things to say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. No problem. So we could do all that digital stuff and make it sound like the modern rappers. He's like, yeah. I don't do digital recordings. I'm going to leave now. <laughs> right. Do you have an auto-tune? So we yeah, 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 right. yeah. That's how we can reach the kids. Press it straight to vinyl. <laughs> All right, Put some so more of those records on it. Is it going? It's going. All right. Awesome. I'm gonna get out of your way here. Make sure I have everything I need. And I'm gonna attempt to shut the fuck up. Uh, don't worry about it. Hop on, <laughs> in. Hop on in. You guys are good. All right. Thank you All so right. much. Thanks, Mike. I guess first off, I wanted to, to hear about church and how you got started on on that and where that came from. Well, it's probably like a bunch of different versions of it. Um, because church is like, uh, it got known for like separate things, like whether it be the photography or the magazines or the shirts. Um, but the basic way it started was um, probably 2005, I think, uh, Paso Robles. Uh, we take a group of people and all go, we go camp there. It's like one of the best shows ever. And um, I used to go every year. And the first thing I would do when I got to the show when the cars were setting up was go into the vendor area and um, buy a piece of art or buy a uh, silkscreen print or magazines or books or something that, uh, and not just anything. It had to be a little more special than that. I, I'm not the kind of guy that's going to buy something just to say that I was there. It has to mean a little bit more than that. And that particular year, um, I didn't buy anything. And I was, I was really bummed. And uh, so while I was crying on my way home, I decided, why wait for other people to make what I want? I'll just make what I want. So that was basically how, how church started. So I got home, and I designed eight shirts right off the bat because uh, I wanted people to think that I was a company <laughs> and not just a kid in his garage, like, making stupid stuff. So, um, yeah, so I did eight shirts right off the bat and uh, never crossed my mind that when the shirts came in, I was going to have to fold them all. So I had like a thousand shirts that I'm sitting on my couch by myself <laughs> folding all these shirts. And then I was like, oh, crap, how am I going to sell these things? So I'm like, I better do a website, which I've never done before. So I designed the website, had a friend, um, you know, kind of help uh, put it up. And then uh, after that, I thought, well, what if, what if I create a little magazine and then I could advertise my own shirts in my own magazine? So the magazine started. And uh, so it all kind of happened at once, but it was basically because uh, I didn't find anything I wanted to buy at Pastor Robles. Where did the name for church come from? Uh, the name for church derived from, um, I mean, probably back from when I was a kid. I, I used to go to car shows constantly with my dad, uh, but both my brothers. I have two brothers, uh, one older and one younger, uh, all in automotive, but uh, we'd all do different stuff in automotive, which is kind of cool. Um, but we used to go to the, the old car shows and my dad had dragsters and he always had like some kind of a hot rod toy that he'd play with and buying and selling parts. And, um, you know, he, he worked for the drag races, which I'm sure will come up at some point, but, um, always at a car show, always at a drag race, always at a swap meet. And even after I graduated college, always at one of the three. So it seemed like every Sunday I was doing something car related and that, that has become my church. So we were talking a little bit about that, actually, and about how like within hot rodding, there's always been like a, a religious aspect om almost to it. Like, you know, like people would would paint devils and stuff on yeah. on shit. And then like in the resurgence of it, like in the 90s, there was like the, the blessing of the cars and and things like that. And how um, naming your magazine church almost seemed to go hand in hand with that religious yeah. connotation to yeah. car culture. And I think some of that um, goes, uh, you know, before that started, I was on the ham for a while and Ryan was instrumental in 
kind of me coming out of my shell a little bit and actually communicating with like-minded folks where normally I'm a complete hermit. So uh, being on the ham introduced me to, to a ton of people, and I think they had a little tagline, you know, saying uh, spreading the gospel. Okay. So I'm sure that that kind of stuck in my head at, at some point. And then um, but when I went to the car shows, I was specifically interested in seeing the cars. I didn't care what bands were playing. I didn't care if there was a pinup competition. I didn't care. And it was nearly impossible to find anything with the word church in it, um, URL related. So I couldn't get, I couldn't get a web, a domain name with the word church in it. So, uh, I ended up doing cars, not culture. And that's kind of where that started. Um, and that's kind of more or less been phased out, not because I care who, who plays <laughs> and if there's a, a pinup competition, but, uh, church equipped is good, is a, like a little broader, and uh, that's like, um, I just redid the website, like new products eventually come in. I'm just kind of baby stepping it and, uh, you know, fake it till you make it, I guess. Well, another part we were talking about too was, um, you know, the car's not, not culture thing. Like having a magazine almost seems inherently cultural, you know, because you are like sending this realm, this world, like all over the place, you know, like somebody in another state could could buy buy church that's never seen anything like this before you know and pick it up and and be like wow like this is this is new to me you really open their eyes you know so like yeah and i think the um the books or my photography or the photography i i use is um i specifically try not to show people i try not to show any modern cars in the background um not that the, it has to be timeless but um, I really strive for that, and I think that that and handicapping myself with the type of equipment I use um, really led me to the more artsy, close-up, detail-y f- photography that um, that I'm, I guess, known for now. And uh, so that that's a little bit odd, but it lets people that don't know anything about cars, they might still like a photograph because of the composition of a color palette, but don't don't like cars or whatever right like aesthetically like you could see like a a script on a car or something and it's just that's a good font you know it looks good you know and and that's cool too because like sometimes when you just see a full picture of a car you you're just standing back and it's like that's a great looking car but you miss the detail of like all the reasons why it's like a great car you know yeah and i'm i'm a believer that you could take a really great photo of a ugly car (laughs) But it's it's just as easy to take a terrible photo, maybe easier to take a terrible photo of a great looking car. So being able to put like um, like one of the the things I really struggle with, and it's it's pretty embarrassing if you if you would actually watch me construct an issue of Church Magazine, um, finding two great photos, like two great photos might not look good next to each other. So I have to find one that looks that doesn't distract from the other one and vice versa but i can i can deconstruct one of my books and lay it out on the floor and as a whole it's balanced i'm like completely ocd with that kind of stuff so it'll be like light page dark page colorful black and white big small uh high contrast i mean it's so insane the amount of thought that i put into something that nobody's gonna notice yeah and the way like the way a car like which direction the car's pointing versus the other page you know that's got a line coming off of a body line it's like it's all extremely well thought out and and (laughs) nobody knows well if it's if it's not like aesthetically meshing then it's like it's it's jarring and not everybody picks up on that, but some people that do will like, you know, open it up and it'll just be, you know, not quite right. But the way that you, you do lay things out where they do flow so well that, it, you know, the mark of a good custom where it's like, it just looks good. Right. Like you, you don't can't have to know why, right. You don't have to pick it apart. It just looks right. So yeah. and the photos, like I try to do, you know, I want like the photo on the left page is a great photo. I hope. The photo on the right page is a great photo, but when you see them both together, it's still, like, you could show them together, and it still looks like one harmonious piece, so it's the madness that I live in. I don't know. It's, it pisses people off, at, like, the kind of finessing I do on just useless, <laughs> useless stuff, but it's the way my brain works, I guess. You said the, the equipment that you use sort of 
limits or restricts your focus. I guess for people who don't know, like what you shoot with, uh, you use a pretty simple uh, like point and shoot camera, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, I started um, taking photos in high school. Um, my older brother at the time was uh, he was taking photo classes at the junior college, mm-hmm. and he constructed. Um, a makeshift dark room in one of our upstairs bathrooms. So he taught me how to develop film black and white, and we could print our own black and white there, and that was cool. And because of my dad and the drag races, um, sometimes we had uh, restricted access to, like, the the top end of a drag strip or something like that, where if something's going to happen, it's going to happen there. So I was um, kind of like a vulture back then, like in... <laughs> When I was like 16, 17, around then. So I would sit at the top of the grandstands as far down as I could towards the end of the track where the cars are like at maximum velocity. And like I said, if something was going to happen, it was going to happen there. And then if there was a crash, hopefully get it on film, (laughs) run to the one hour. That's dark. Oh, it's bad. But But because my dad worked for NHRA, like... I know the guys are safe. Like, I know the cars are safe. I know, they'll like, get them out I know of there. That stuff. And then if something, you know, if someone was really hurt or something, those photos don't get, they don't get seen. Yeah. But, and there was, and it wasn't just me. There was a bunch of photographers that would hang out in that area. And then if there's something bad happened, everybody'd run to the one hour photo, get their photos developed first, and then run back to the track and then um, try to sell them to the magazines. Oh. So I, uh, was that it? At Fremont, or no, this was uh, this wherever. Like I've been, I used to travel to drags with my dad um, when he was working. But I would do like uh, both races in Pomona. I do Phoenix. I do Seattle. I'd go to uh, Colorado, Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I I get to like six or eight a year. And then plus you know Bakersfield and Sears Point and stuff like that. So when I was I guess a junior in high school. Um, a couple of accidents happened at Sears Point in Sonoma, and um, I got in my first uh, my first magazine. Uh, my brother got the cover. I mean, his stuff was ridiculous. So I made the with the money I made from being in the magazine, I made these business cards, and um, uh, on the back of the card was uh, this funny card just engulfed in fire. And uh, the guy's name was Dave Benjamin. And my dad told me two stories about this Dave Benjamin guy. One was that uh, he had really long hair and that I should always keep my camera focused on that guy. And um, so way back when, he caught on fire. And he had, because his hair was long, it would get in front of his eyes. And he duct taped his hair to his forehead. (laughs) But when he caught on fire, it melted the duct tape to his face. Oh, my God. So uh, that, that was a mess. And I wasn't there for that, but this is the same guy. And the other story my dad told me about, well, not a story, but um, my dad said that Dave Benjamin would be better off in a front engine jet car, which I think is absolutely <laughs> hilarious. So I had um, so these business cards. That was on the back, and the front said, um, Hot Shots Photography. And, of course, the shots had a Z in it because that was the cool thing to do back in 1988. And... Um, but underneath the little tagline said, you crash it, we flash it. <laughs> totally horrible, horrible, horrible. So I used to shoot with like a real big boy camera. But my older brother was always better. And uh, so I decided that once he went off to college and I went off to college, he was going to pursue more photography and I would change directions and pursue more design. So after I got out of college and started going to the races again, I never realized how much work it was carrying the big cameras around with all the lenses in the bag and the motor drives and the power liners and all that crap. So I I put it all down and I bought um, a Canon Digital Elf, like 2.3 megapixel point and shoot. And it really limits what I can take photos of because I can't get action. I can't, I can't really shoot night stuff with it. Um, so it really limited to me, me and that, that's a big part of why the books became what they became. And I know the the very first issue of church, um, is smaller than the other ones. It's five by five. I think it's 52 pages, but with the 2.3 megapixel camera, that was as big as I could make the image at 300 DPI before it started to pixelate. So (laughs) it really limited the size of the book. And I just kind of kept it. I mean, it's more or less pocket size. 
But like a lot of that too is like like composition and just like knowing what colors look good together and yeah. stuff like that. It's that's not that's not tools. That's you. You know. Yeah. Well, I get asked constantly like if I put a photo up um, that somebody li- like that somebody likes, it's what kind of camera to use, and it has nothing to do with the camera. And I've gone through a variety of pocket digital cameras, but um, I don't think I've really used a photo from my camera in a year. I, I shoot everything on my iPhone now. And mm-hmm. I I just did a whole two week trip back east. I don't I don't know if I'm gonna go back to a camera. Confession time. We got some photos published in a in a magazine <laughs> and um yeah, we shot them all with an iPhone 3. Yeah, I think they yeah. thought they were real pictures, but they were just iPhone pictures. Yeah. <laughs> but it worked. It worked. They were published and they looked good, so. Yeah. it's. Uh, I mean, I can't really use them for comps for my day job, but, uh, you know, occasionally I can. Get away can with it. Yeah. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Cause so it, I think like 90, probably 98% of my Instagram feed is all is all with my phone. That's not downloaded. No, there's no retouching. Right. There's no downloading. There's no whatever so it's just that's i take it on my phone it's pretty cool i mean it, it seems way. like when you see the whole finished thing like the church magazine in your hand it seems pretty deliberate but uh it's cool to hear that it just sort of came together naturally and it really mirrored like the the whole car culture aesthetic around 2005 where you build what you can with what you have yeah so, yeah yeah so it works together in documenting the style that it's documenting uh, know where i'm going with that yeah but it's, it's it is i mean it's using simple tools and basically i come from a, a graphic design background that's yeah. what i do for my day job i do like um movie poster campaigns for studios like billboards bus sites movie posters standees like that's what i do for for my day job so that kind of translated easily into doing church stuff but um i just mixed it you know with my love of of the automobile and customs and hot rods and horsepower and candy paint and hand lettering and you know i just mixed the two and it was just kind of match made in heaven and then eventually you know i'll, I'll catch up with my brother again and I'd, I'd love to do a book with him you know sometimes i mean he's done i there's two church issues with his photos but i think like a real a real book at some point would be nice and i mean it's all self-funded i don't sell advertising so i come i don't do subscriptions i i when time and money allow, you know, I'll come out, I'll come out with another one. It's really like, it's very apparent. Like this is your passion. Like, yeah, yeah totally. Like, yeah. especially like when you, you're not like making money off of this, you're no. just doing this because it's the thing that you like, there's a drive, you have to do it, you yeah. know, like yeah. it's, and, and it I comes know, through. But like the problem with that though, for me is like, I know, I know that nobody can tell me what to do because I only do what I want to do. And, uh, but the problem is that um, if it fails, like I know, I know who to blame on that part too. Like if, if I know I'm the guy holding it back. Like it could be bigger than what it is, and I just don't really try. Like I used to sell at the shows, but that's so much work, as you guys know. Yeah. Oh Lord. So I mean, being the being there at five o'clock in the morning, and then unloading, and then moving your car, and then coming back and selling and then being tired and then tearing down and going to get your car and swimming upstream against all the people trying to leave and then the last one out. I mean, it was just... Yeah, it's a and, hustle. And making yeah. work out of a place that everyone else comes to enjoy is very wearing. Yeah, and then you too. miss the show. Exactly. So, and then, you know, after a while, there was so many vendors, you know, there'd be 50 t-shirt vendors or whatever and trying to go for the same the same clientele. So that's why I decided, you know what, I just want to make what I want. So, like, you haven't seen a church shirt with a skull and crossbones on it. You haven't seen a church shirt with um, pinstriping. You haven't seen a shirt with, uh, you know, pinup girls or stuff like that. And it's not to say that it won't happen. It's just I have to come up with a concept or or something that makes that would make me want to wear it. Yeah. And then then I'll do it. And if, if they don't sell, I don't care. I'll, I mean, I got that's what you'll be wearing for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, and, and I have plenty of Christmas gifts. To right. Wear, so. Well, all the shirt designs, though, that you've had thus far are very, like, um, almost minimalistic, where it's, they speak for themselves, you know? Like, it's not, not to say that some of those other things are pandering, but it's, it's not, what am I saying here? Nick, you know what I'm trying to say here? Like, your shirt designs are just, they're just good. They're just solid. Like, well, when it comes to my design, 
sensibilities, um, be it with movie posters or with this kind of stuff, simplicity, like to me, it's like the idea is king. So get the idea across and then as simple, as simple as can be. And that's kind of the way my life is in general. Um, I'm a complete hermit. I work out of my house. I don't get out much except for the car shows. I, I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I don't. It's like I know what I'm good at, and I stick with those few things. I, I, I do design. I eat. And I'm a crappy sleeper, but I, I lay down to rest. Like, that. that's that's what I do. Like, I don't. It's, it's really simple, and I've been told it's, like, so... I'm so simple, it's complicated, but um, but that's the way I design. So when I design a shirt, like uh, like one of the first ones I did was, it was just the highlights of uh, 36 Ford, and it was based loosely on um, John Fisher's 36, and uh, but it's just the highlights on a black shirt. So I actually drew more of the car, and then I get rid of everything I don't need until you just get the essence, yeah, I... the essence of a car. I don't know if a lot of people think about how much thought goes into designing a t-shirt, but if you're doing screen printing, like, what's the most screens you've ever used on a shirt? I can't imagine it's more than three. Three is the most, yeah. It, that's Again, you're working with the, the medium you're creating with, and that guides your, your artistic development of the thing that you're building. It's Yeah, most often, like I think two colors is probably the most common shirt that I'll do, or uh, the amount of colors, and then I try to make the color of the shirt as an additional color. So like with a highlight shirt, like that goes on a black shirt, but you would be surprised how many people are like, hey, do you have that on a white shirt? I'm like, well, it wouldn't work on, yeah. it wouldn't work on white because they're highlights. So you'd have to do only shadows, with, but then... Um, it's hard to explain that. that. Keith, <laughs> but that's more Keith Wiesner. You know, he does the black and white and his stuff's amazing. But like this shirt was complete opposite of his. And he draws, you know, the whole car and the... He can get the scene in there, and mine, I just can't. Like, I just, I don't think that way. I just don't. Like, one of the favorite shirts that I did was uh, Rear Three Quarters of uh, uh, 64 Pontiac Bonneville, and there are so few lines. Yeah, I still have that one. You wore it last night. I did. It was one of my worst-selling shirts. Was really? It's one of my favorite designs that I've ever done. There's so few lines that actually... And you still get what that is. Yeah. That's the one where it's on the back and then the front just yeah, says church. Like a big circle on the back. Yeah. 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 But that design, I absolutely love it. And, but there's almost no, there's no information there, but you know what it is. Yeah. So yeah. But that kind of stuff, I absolutely love and just like mind tricks. I mean, I did that one a couple of years ago with the funny car and the parachute and it just shows the graphics and the parachute helps create like the negative space of the funny car body and it just seems to work. I mean, my brother think it's a big, it's a, he thinks it's a, a turkey tail, but <laughs> it's a parachute. No, it's, trust it's, me, it's a parachute. One of the funny things talking to the Espinosa is they said they did their chain wheel shirt, like their first big famous design. And when they talked to you, you said you were doing something similar and they were like, fuck, we shouldn't have done that. I want to see what Kobe did. <laughs> yeah, they've asked me about it because I told them I wanted to do a, a chain steering wheel design and they want to see it just to see yeah. <laughs> just to see what I would have have done. So I don't know if it uh, it could still happen. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not sure. <laughs> you guys could do but some sort of different. crossover shirt or something. Yeah, well, there's been talks about that too. I know Jesus has mentioned something and I have an idea for that. And then they mentioned, you know, they might want to be doing a an art show of some sort. I don't know if they talk to you about it, but, um, you know, that would be another opportunity to do. It'd be awesome. Yeah. Something like they that. have a space now. So it's really, yeah, really... I can't, I can't wait to see it. I mean, they've been, they're awesome. Yeah. I don't even really know what to say. <laughs> Instrumental in supporting like the, the scene for sure. Or I hate using the word scene, but for lack yeah. of a better word. Yeah. Cause I think I met, I met Juan in 2004. Five, I think it was 2005 at the very end of the racetrack in Bakersfield of all places. And, uh, I mean, church hadn't really started yet and dead end was barely starting or, and it's, we were probably at the same, yeah. the same, um, spot with the companies. Um, but there was just something about him and we were shooting the car and I, I know that I, I shot the photos in issue one, so I know it was before issue one, but, um, there was just something talking about him where, he was kind of figuring out where they were going with it. I was trying to figure out where I was going with it. And I knew we were going to eventually possibly try to get to the same destination, but we had completely different roadmaps on how we were going to get there. 
So it was like an immediate, immediate friendship. And then once, you know, meeting, you know, Juan and now Dead End is so much bigger than those two. I mean, it's those two, but it's, yeah, it's so much bigger than that. And then I know after my second issue came out, when I did uh, issue three, um, there was a, there was a episode uh, with a little Ill- an illness in between, like around issue two. But while we're talking about Dead End, um, I knew that that they were online only and they couldn't afford print. Right. And uh, I thought that I could maybe use church for good and uh, try to help a couple of people that I really respected their photography and um, and maybe financially, you know, put together a book where I couldn't pay them, but I could give them books of their work. If they let me use their work, I could give them books and they can in turn sell those and be and recoup you know, some of the money and they retain all the rights to the photography and stuff. And I think it took them some time and probably talking to a few people before they, they trusted me with their photography. That was church three, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's my, my that's my favorite favorite one. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So totally my favorite one. Because like, I mean, I can't say that I came like as much as I love, you know, low riders and the crazy paint and stuff like that. Like my style of photography and their style of photography is so different, but yeah. it just gave me so much more respect for the that culture and, and what they do. So I hope I can work with them several more times. Yeah, yeah you guys should That's definitely try and try and do something. You together about a year or so ago, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I had wanted to go, and then I had met Toshi, uh, local hero at the time, yeah. um, in Santa Maria a few years back, and I... I, I, I I didn't. I had never met him before, but I had seen his photography again on the ham, and uh, he he came up to me almost like a tourist and didn't tell me he was local hero and he wanted a picture with me and him in the van. Yeah. So, and I didn't find out until after until who he was. And uh, but yeah, I, I had to get to Japan, and I know that Juan and Jesus had already been a couple of times, and they kept kept pushing, kept pushing, kept pushing, and then finally I was just like. I got to do it. I got to do it. So, um, and I ended up, uh, I ended up going for a month Wow! and I, I'd saved up some money and I flew out there. Uh, I met them there. I was nervous as crap. And, um, so I hung out with Juan, uh, and the, and a couple of guys, uh, and Toshi at the beginning and, you know, Toshi took us around to the shops and stuff like that. And then, um, Juan left. And I stayed for two weeks pretty much on my own. And uh, I would, you know, stay at um, at Udai's place or, you know, take the train. Or I'd get to one place and uh, they'd say, oh, you should go here. So I'd go to Hiroshima or, like, oh, you should go here or you should go there. And I just, I had a train pass and I was just going all over the place with no real, no real direction. And uh, occasionally Toshi would, he would just fly to wherever I was and hang out for a day, take me to a shop you know, say to Mr. G's shop or whatever, and mm-hmm. then fly back. And like, who does that? Like, it's, That's awesome. that sounds it's wild. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I could handle the culture shock. Yeah. So I ended up while I was there. I mean, I wanted to go. The main reason I went, even as much as I wanted to go to the Moon Eye show, I, um, because of, of Dead End and Toshi, I wanted to support Toshi's show. Yeah. So that was the plan to go to Cal Flavor. And so I went to Cal Flavor, and then the I think the following week there was a, a low rider show that was a disaster. And then um, after that there was another show that um, I went to uh, with uh, HK, the guy that has next movie that Impala, okay. that crazy yeah, yeah. Impala, speaks virtually no English. So he picks me up like not much communication. That's like <laughs> next movie, uh, Van Gogh. <laughs> Van Gogh. <laughs> so um, and that that show was pretty awesome. And then I waited and uh, I went to the Moon Eye show and it just blew my mind. Yeah. So I think that this year's the um, twenty five year anniversary of either Moon Eyes in Japan or the Moon Eye show. There's it's a big deal this year. So hopefully I can get back. Um, they should have the van there. But no you're just saying, just, just, saying, just saying, throwing it, it out would, there. It would kill over there. And it's been in their magazines and they know about it, but there's just, I, I don't know. I don't know how they go about, you know, picking and choosing their cars. And I know they're heavy into motorcycles, but I think, yeah. I think it would do well over there. So van or not, I'm, I, I really want to get there this year. That's awesome. Have you published photos from there yet? No, uh, I haven't. And actually I'm probably 94. 
five percent done with issue ten, and it's all Japan. That's awesome. going to be amazing. And I, w- I was, I would love to debut it in Japan, but um, I just like I haven't been super motivated the last couple of months. So I could, I know I can knock it out in a weekend if I if I do it. And it takes three week, you know, it takes three weeks to print, and then a chunk of money. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I've learned really quickly why they sell advertising in magazines. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. that is not cheap. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's, that's the next one. And I'm, I'm probably 95% done, done with it. Just got to get in the right headspace. Yeah. Sit yeah. down for a weekend and, you know, coming up here this weekend is how I missed the grand nationals this weekend, which, or this year, which was bad. Um, but I just went to, you know, a little trip back East. So I'm, I'm, trying to get back in the groove again and uh it'll happen it'll it'll definitely happen and i don't know how many books there will be you know it could be stop at 10 or then do a coffee table book or i could just do 20 i I have no idea it's just when time and money allow it just kind of i'll figure it out i do actually i do think there will be an 11th well i can think in my head other books (laughs) that i'd like to do but i mean there's a couple of other photographers that um i'd like to get in the mix and some like one it just didn't as much as I love the photography of this person, um, when I started laying it out in book form, it was it was the same. It was it was a very dense, heavy book, and I just I didn't think it was going to work. So it, yeah, so it didn't. You know, no offense to them, because I absolutely love their photography, but it just didn't work. Photo after photo after photo. As a collective piece, it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. So then there's another person that I want, and. Uh, like initially he said no, and then he came back yes, and then it might be a no again. So I, I have no idea. So, but I like to, you know, it'll be my own photos. If not, like I'll do more of my brother. Like I have, I have options if I want to go that route. I just, just got to do it. And there's cool. a new person picking up a camera every, yeah, every day. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I know even like I, I don't have. I, there's been a couple of people that say, hey, I want you to make a book for me. And it's like, of course you do. <laughs> it's, like, it's my money and you don't have to do any work. Like, right. Why not? Like, right. I, would love, I would love that opportunity as well. But um, that's, I've been asked a couple of times, but the one that's that's really got me thinking and um, is Mira, 3LA or Mira from oh, Japan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really like her stuff. It's a little more culture, but she has like more... Like her style of shooting has more atmosphere than mine does, like more street lights and stuff like that. So, I think that if if she has a big variety, I mean that's a it's a definite possibility, definite possibility. I mean I think, I think she should do it with Dead End. I mean would be a better fit, yeah. You know with those guys, but if they're not going to do print, then you know that's that's something I'll, I'll definitely. Well, consider. they did end up coming out with their book, which was yeah, which yeah, is awesome. But that, that was, was so 10 cool. Years. You know, that's yeah. that's ten years of photography to make that book. Yeah. So. And self-published. That's hard. Like yeah. I can respect the hell out of that. Holy shit. Yeah, I try. I mean, because I that's how churches. Um, I try to respect whether I like them or not. You know, I'll buy I'll buy those issues or at least the first issues or a book or something. If if somebody's willing to sacrifice, you know, put their name on it. I have to, you know, and I think that uh, like one of the things I'd love to do with church, which isn't ever really discussed is, uh, I think that there should be like a community of self publishers and say, say you set aside a hundred books and you give 10 to this publication, 10 to that publication, 10 to that publication. And then everybody can sell everybody else's books to help spread the word. You know, people in Australia or Japan or wherever Germany are making their own books. But you know, if I send them 10 and they send me 10, then I can get their name out here a little bit. They can get my name out there a little bit. And hopefully they're different enough to where, you know, we're not stealing each other's, <laughs> you know, money. But, I mean, I don't even know if there's that much money in it at all to begin with. But just to... Tangible, to tangible burn. items are, like, with social media, it's... Things have really, really changed. You know, like, you know, we, we used to have a shop and sell merchandise. And, like, now it's, like, people, you know, they, they go to a store and they... They see a thing on the shelf and they think that thing's cute and they just take a picture of it and post it and then they get their their kudos for it yeah. existing in their realm yeah. versus before social media where they had to actually like purchase this thing and right. then, then and then it, have it. Yeah. yeah. So then people would know. But but yeah, social media has really, really changed a lot about how people um 
consume and not consume in a negative way just like how they interact with tangible goods yeah how they yeah. interact okay. with ta- how you how people buy magazines how people like buy t-shirts how people yeah. whatever you know like yeah well i've noticed like when i said like there's points where i've tried different you know st- strategies but uh you know if i have four shirts up people might buy one because they could make a decision between four shirts up but if i have 12 shirts up they might not be able to choose and then they'll go to the next guy who's got four shirts up so, but you never know. I mean, more often than not, someone's like, oh, I'd buy that shirt if it was in white. Or, oh, do you have that with a pocket on it? Do you have a mock turtleneck? Do you have a long sleeve? It's like, that guy's not going to buy a shirt no matter what. Yeah. So, You're giving me bad flashbacks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it doesn't matter no matter what. So, like I said, like, I, have a, so I don't think I've sold at a car show in two years. And yeah, things, are, things have not, just changed. That's not good for business. Right. <laughs> but, um, but I've been enjoying shows again. I can go take my photos. Um the establishment of church, I cannot tell you how many people I've met because of it. It's been a complete gift. Like, I'm so blessed that I could go to a car show and see another person wearing one of my shirts or somebody recognizes me with a shirt or, or whatever. It's it's made me meet a ton of people that I wouldn't have normally met. Yeah, especially being someone that's kind of, you know, guarded and, and such that it, it helps break that break that ice yeah it was pretty funny last week i was at there's this uh artist that i like he makes like these metal sculptures his name's tom patsis and he's uh, in indianapolis and uh he started out with like you know he was working on uh, top fuel cars and he makes a bunch of really cool stuff out of like broken engine parts but i was over there and um a bunch of guys a bunch of helmet painters i was in town for the indy 500 so a bunch of helmet painters that had painted a bunch of stuff for the indy 500 were uh they they came by the shop and i just happened to be there and um there was uh this one guy that started talking to me and he's like "I, i know who you are and i was like completely out of the loop with with this group of people and he goes i know who you are he goes i know your shirts i know your photography i know your books i know your van I love everything you do, but I can't figure out what you're trying to sell me. <laughs> and I was like, I'm like, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> so I'm not really trying to sell anything. Right. I mean, it would help if I did because all that money just goes towards making more stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was a really kind of an eye opener. I don't know what you're trying to sell me. Huh. Like, oh, that's, that's a terrible business model. <laughs> you're thinking too hard about this, kid. Yeah, Shut yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I have a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where do you grow up? I'm from Cupertino, California. So okay. So California, it's where Apple Computer's located. Yeah. So that's where I was born and raised. And, um, you know, I didn't remember the first house we lived at, but um, we lived kind of across the street from um, the elementary school. The junior high was behind it, and the high school was right next to it. So we just walked everywhere. And, uh, yeah, so I was born and raised, my two brothers uh, and my two parents. So I have no aunts no uncles no grandparents huh. no nothing so the family's the family's pretty tight um and then uh my dad worked at the time for nhra he was like the liaison between the fuel cars the nitro cars i'm a pro stock too and um and the nhra so he was he was gone quite a bit at uh at drag races and um when he wasn't at drag races he was a high school teacher so he taught at Fremont High School, and uh, my freshman year of high school, he transferred to uh, my high school. Oh, fuck. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, and he, I mean, he taught a bunch of classes, but he taught driver's ed, so he knew when all my tests were, you know, and all my friends knew who <laughs> who he was and were taking his classes to learn how to drive and all that stuff. So it was a little bit more awkward maybe for me than I guess my older brother my younger brother came in you know and my dad was still there so, so next question to this yeah. what was what was your first car oh my gosh um, I think this is a really really telling question oh, about people this is a really embarrassing question <laughs> so my dad's deal was um we could have any car we want that was the deal but we had to pay for half of it so if we could only afford a $500 car, like he would match whatever we put into it. So my first car was a gold 1982 uh, Camaro nice. with a uh, gold velour interior and T-tops. That's very sexy. <laughs> it was, 
Yeah. I think the license plate said Kobe Z on it. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, it was special. It yeah. Was special. Hot shit in high school, huh? Uh, what do you do? What do you do? <laughs> my brother, my older brother is the one that had all the awesome cars. He, his, uh, I think his first car was a 57 Chevy, but he's, um, he's shorter than me. He's 5'6". And uh, it had a four-speed um, with a bench seat, mm-hmm. and he had to push the bench seat all the way forward. <laughs> and uh, when he did that, he couldn't get second and fourth. <laughs> so instead of notching the seat, uh, they sold the car, and he got a 65 Mustang Fastback, black with white pony interior, static dropped it, I mean, super crazy low, and was hitting all the freeway reflectors with his someone in the car. I mean, mm-hmm. that car's on my short list, and I know if he could get a car back, it would be that one. But he had, he was going through cars quite a bit where I stuck with the Z <laughs> So I went to college, and then I had an S10 Blazer just to get my stuff down there. But yeah, I, I, I had a mullet with it, you know, it was the whole commitment. <laughs> yeah, commitment. If you're gonna do it, Holy you might dress, as well. Ash and lost pants. Do yeah, it. All of it. I didn't. Yeah, I couldn't. Uh, I, I never. I was so skinny. Like I couldn't peg my pants or anything. <laughs> but yeah, I had the acid wash and the stone. Whatever. We could move on to the next subject if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about cars, I, I definitely want to talk about Van Gogh. For, does anyone pretentious call it fun? Huh? No. Okay. no. <laughs> Just I, you. Just, no, no. Just yeah. you. But um. When you bring that up, uh, so after the car was done, I drove it to Santa Maria. Was I think the first? Well, I mean, I didn't drive it to. It wasn't technically done at the Grand National, but when I drove it to um, Santa Maria, my favorite pinstriper um, is Makoto. Yeah. And um, I mean, he's just hands down my favorite. So I have this little thing that hides. Uh, I don't like seeing the modern stuff, like the airbag switches and gauges and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So um, I have this little little thing that comes down and covers that up, and I wanted him to paint. Van Gogh on it, so he uh, he draws it out and it says "Go Van," and I'm like, "No, no, no!" So we had to redraw it and say "Van Gogh." So, but yeah, yeah. So the van, um, it kind of started uh, with what we talked about before with going to car shows and how big of a mess it it was. Yeah. So I thought that if I could do a van, I could actually sell out of a van in my own space. Um, that was the master plan. Um, so I was at a drag race in uh, Las Vegas, and we were talking to this uh, longtime family friend named Mike Jiri, and uh, he had worked on a bunch of cars and stuff like that, and every time we'd see this guy, he would kind of ask, you know, hey, what's up with the Bonneville? What's up with this? What's up with that? What's your mm-hmm. next car? And I'm like, you know, I think I want to do a van. And he's like, a van? And I'm like, yeah, he, what would you do to it? I'm like, all right, I want to do this and this and this and this and this and this. And he goes, all right, here's the deal. I have a 63 Econoline sitting in my front yard. It doesn't run or drive, but the engine's there. It doesn't have any rust on it, but there's dents all over it. If you do what you say you're going to do to this van, you can have it. So we got it. it. That's it? That's That's it. It's a free, it's the world's most expensive free (laughs) car. That's amazing. Was he, like, after he saw it all done up and stuff, was he just like, this isn't the same van? He followed the entire build. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so he followed the entire build. Um, He's, like, the van's biggest fan. Yeah, that's that's really cool. So, uh, but I, I don't think he's seen it in person. And there's a little van show. There's a thing, uh, there's, like, a big gap between i'm a custom car guy that has a van and there are vanners and there's vanners are vanners and um i've gone to van shows and stuff like that like some of those van shows that i've gone to are my favorite people um but i don't think that they really understand where my motivation for the van came from and i could be wrong but um but they have something called C of C, and it's Council of Councils, and they they all gather once a year in some community, and it's kind of like the rules of the banners and the bylaws, and they talk about the big events that they're going to do and stuff like that. And uh, right after the Grand Nationals, they had a, a little one in um, Buena Park, I think was the last one that was in California, and they beg- begged me to get the van there, and... Uh, Right after the Grand Nationals, uh, we pulled the interior, we pulled the um, the carpet out. I didn't like the carpet that was in it for there, so we pulled it out. Someone else did it. Uh, I was sick as a dog, um, but they it was raining, sick, 
so they actually came to the shop, picked it up, took it to the show so they could have it. This guy named, I'm going to get his last name right, wrong, uh, Doug Nykinen. He's out of Canada. He has been a massive supporter of Van Gogh and the whole fanning community, like spreading the word and stuff like that. So he's been instrumental with, with Van Gogh. So I got it to the show, and then I, I left. I went home, came back later, picked it up, take it back to the shop so they could finish putting the seats back in and stuff like that. But there's a there's one of these COCs is in um, is in Las Vegas in February, and I want to drive the van there to give Mike Jerry a ride in it up and down the strip. So cool. if I can go, if I can do it, I'll do it. Yeah. So I I, I mean I owe it to him. So yeah, so um, so yeah, so he gave me the van, and uh, I catch a little. Like I did not build the van. I make that perfectly clear. I've never claimed I built the van. I don't build cars. I wish I could. Um, I'm a I'm a designer, so I design stuff. So I know what I want it to look like. I just don't know how to get it there. And uh, so I my first call was to a guy named Kevin Francis, and he had a shop called K Custom in Huntington Beach. And I know he built a bunch of stuff before. Uh, super cool guy, one of the guys that we used to go to um, Paso Robles with. And I told him what I wanted to do, and um, he's like, let me let me just think about this. So he calls a couple weeks later, and he goes, I know how we can get this thing on the ground and make it drivable. Because to the best of my knowledge, it's never been done before. So you go online, you can't find out how to do it because it's not been done before. But this was what you did? This, this was, uh, well, the van... The band's been done for five and a half years, and it was a two and a half year build, so it's been eight years. And that was probably right before I started the van. I saw um, E Dog's van, yeah. and uh, that thing was awesome. And it was, I mean, it was low, but you could kind of tell that, like, you know, it had, you know, if it got side pipes on it to cheat it a little bit. There's ways to cheat a car low. Yeah, big ass bumper, yeah. yeah. So, Sorry, you know. don't. <laughs> he, he figured it out and had a ton of attitude, and that's when I'm like, you know what, I could sell. I could sell out of a van, so make sure that E Dog gets his credit. Cause that know. was like the and beginning of one, like the the right. van thing too. You know, before that, vans there weren't yeah. really cool. Yeah. You know, in what two thousand seven? I don't know. And Shortly after we saw E Dogs too. I think this was probably like two thousand eight, maybe. Yeah, it was somewhere around there. So I made sure he was one of the guys that would he would keep on me and say, "Hey, I want to see a picture of the van. Like, what have you done? What else yeah. are you doing?" And stuff like that. So, he, I mean, he's been awesome through the whole thing so uh but kevin francis figured out how to lower it and then so they they lowered it i mean we had to raise the inner fender wells and then you lose all your headroom and then because you're sitting right on that wheel and there was like a big kick in the rear and the drive shaft goes right through the middle of the car and um so uh yeah so he figured that out and um uh you know we put a mustang 2 in it and i use we liberally but um the so mustang 2 went in it and uh i you know, I didn't want to see the disc brakes up front, so we used, you know, the steel wheels, and then, you know, it's got the drums in the back. Um, but I contacted this guy named Rob Fortier, and uh, I just have a tremendous amount of respect for this guy. He's been in the game forever. He's got, I mean, killer hot rods, customs, motorcycles, all of it. Um, I just want to make sure that I establish that I really <laughs> respect this guy, because uh, he was the editor, I think, of uh, one of the truck magazines, like Street Trucks, or so, I, I can't remember exactly what magazine it was. And uh, I emailed him, and uh, he he knows who I am, but uh, we're not we're not super tight. But he knows who I am, mm-hmm. so I said, um, "Hey, I'm gonna do a custom van, and uh, we're gonna put a Mustang two in it. Um, what do you think about doing a how to put a Mustang two in an Econ line?" Yeah. And he goes, "Man, I don't know what to tell you. Um, you're in no man's land here. Yeah. He's like, this is a van. He's like, this isn't a, ro- a hot rod. He's like, it's not a custom. I'm like, oh, it's a custom. And he's it's not a hot rod, and it's not a custom." I don't think we can help you. I'm like, hey, no problem. So after that, I pretty much kept it under wraps. Yeah. And I figured I was going to get lambasted by all my friends, all my peers, whatever. And I'm like, I just, just let's let this thing settle down. So, uh, yeah, we put the Mustang 2 in it. And um, I wanted the hinges gone. and uh, But those, those bodies are a lot more round than you would expect them to be. Yeah. So uh, they didn't, uh, the K Custom, they didn't figure out how to do the, they take the hinges out. But I wanted the split bumpers so we get a little more air to the engine. I wanted um, I wanted to get rid of the turn signals and fill those ribs up front and then put the signals in the headlights. So we did that. I wanted the gas tank cap gone and moved. I wanted all the seams filled. Um, we uh, 
to lower the license plate because I think the first time we dropped it, 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 it like just crushed the license plate. <laughs> um, I wanted uh, 50 Pontiac taillights in it because it's basically the same size, but it's got a little, you know, a little chrome around it. Um, so they did, yeah, so they did a bunch of stuff. And then um, it went up to uh, Tim Condor's shop up in, it was in Sonoma at the time. He's in Santa Rosa now. And basically um, it, he was going to do body and paint. And I knew what I wanted paint wise. Uh, I wanted, you know, Larry Watson ish. Um, but uh, subtle colors because um, I didn't want it to overpower the all the custom stuff that had been done on the van, and uh, I still wanted those hinges gone. And uh, working with Tim was very um, I don't even know how to describe it, but it was like uh, what if? Yeah, he's so creative. So I'm like, this is what I want to do, and then he's like, well, what if we did this? And then well, what if it was this? And then what if it was that? So that was the point where the van became way more than it was supposed to be. I mean, it was never supposed to be as nice as it is. Yep. And um, so he, I mean, he did the body and the paint and all that stuff's blind, especially out of the front end. He, I'm sure, mashed his knuckles multiple times. He's the guy that figured out how to do the hinges. And um, I told him which color I wanted to paint the van, and he absolutely hated it. He did not want to paint it. Yep. He, he painted the van a different color and what to, color was it uh he mixed he mixed the color i wanted with uh i think it was 50 50 with orion silver so he just that's wanted, a beautiful color yeah. yeah um so but he mixed the he mixed the color with silver and he said he put it outside and it just kind of died and um in hindsight like i don't blame him because if if i was a car painter and you see that big box come in it's an empty canvas yeah I and mean, you could do every trick in the book and i think that that's a lot of times that's what happens his eye his i think his eyes got really big and he could do every trick in the book and it would be the world's biggest you know business card and i'm like now i want i don't want to take away from all the custom stuff and so uh i came up and i, I told him basically what i wanted uh, i think the first couple doodles i did was probably a more 70s style and uh he he laid out these panels and i went up and i'm like done to do it so he painted it and uh in the middle of this um i had intended on using another upholsterer mm -hmm. and uh they were going through some they were going through a, a tough uh personal time and it was recommended that um maybe maybe i didn't use them for this job so tim and i had discussed uh you know our possibilities with having the um having lost all my headroom in the van and Tim goes, well, what if it was like an Eames potato chip chair front seat? He's like, like a school chair. And, um, you know, it went with mid-century modern, the same era as the van, but just taking taking it out of the automotive industry and taking it, you know, into architecture and stuff like that. So that, that sparked the whole wooden interior, but I still only had my budget to do the budget I was going to do, which is, it was a fair budget um, to do the upholstery for the van. So, uh I told Tim, I go, we'll do the wood, the wood if you can find someone that can fit it in that budget. So he found a couple of people, said absolutely not, and then <laughs> one company said that they could do it, and they built these custom, like these really crazy custom wood beds, and they shipped them off to Hawaii, like big, big bucks, and uh, they took on the job for my budget um, just for the challenge, but then the market tanked, and the company went out, and uh, they were done, so... I had a barely started wood interior van, and um, one guy, this guy named Pablo Perez, uh, worked for the company. Uh, and he's basically out of a job. So he said he would do it for the remainder of the budget by himself, mm -hmm. um, but he didn't have a shop. So Tim let him use his shop, which basically turned his paint shop into a huge sawdust snow globe. Holy shit. It's bad for painting. Right. So it pushed the paint way back. Like the van was supposed to come out a year before it came out. But because of the woodwork, more than anything, um, it didn't happen. But it let Tim oversee the woodwork and make sure that it was, you know, we wanted everything rounded, almost like a skate ramp on the inside yeah. versus, you know, having it all squared off and stuff like that um, to go with all the corners of it, like, you know, all the, the roundness of the van. So Tim got to oversee that. He got to work one-on-one -on -one with this guy. Um, it was that that extra year was the best thing that could have happened to the van. It let Tim paint it in stages and let the paint shrink. And I mean, it's... and you get to really like think about what you want to do instead of just like yeah. just like doing the first thing that you think. Yeah. And then 
yeah. maybe later on yeah, it's still not stuck on, yeah i was still stuck on the colors and the basic watson you know watson theme um but uh yeah so so tim tim did it and we trailered it to the first show i didn't it wasn't registered it wasn't licensed i mean it wasn't insured it wasn't yeah. anything so uh i didn't drive it to the show and uh so kevin trailered it to the show and uh i mean that was a whole nother mess because I emailed a couple of pictures to John Buck, um, the guy that's behind the Grand Nationals, and um, he's just like, I, I don't know what to do with this van. Like, I don't, I don't know where it goes. <laughs> I have no idea what category to put this in. And I go, oh, it's a custom. And I go, this needs to go up against. I go, I want this in a custom class. It needs to go up against Richard Zoki and John D'Agostino and whoever else is in that class. I would rather have my ass handed to me. Be beat by the best. Yeah, as a custom. Yeah. Instead of being put in a van class with yeah. maybe one other van. Like, it yeah. just didn't make any sense. So uh, he's like, no. He's like, this is a van. It doesn't go in a custom class. I'm like, well, why is that convertible not in a convertible class? That's in a custom class. And this convert. And he's like, well, that's John D'Agostino or whatever. So yeah. he's like, where's the van right now? And I go, it's at Pete Santini's shop. He was cutting and buffing it. And um, he's like, I'm really tight with Pete Santini. I'm going to get his two cents. So he calls Pete Santini. He's like, Pete, he's like, what are we going to do with this damn van? And he goes, you're going to give it a corner spot. You're going to give it a 20 by 20 space. You're going to let him open the doors. And this is going to be the hit of the show. Oh, yeah. And um, he's just like, where, where do we put, what room do we put it in? And Pete actually fought. That was the same year that the van debuted, 2011 was the same year that they had the customs then and now show. Yeah, that was probably our favorite time down at Pomona. It was such and an amazing weekend. Pete tried like crazy. He thinks that this, this van was going to be an iconic car, and he wanted that in that, that part of the show. And the Buck said, there's absolutely no way. There's no room. That, that room is filled. And the only way it could have been in there was if Pete would have taken his car out. Oh. And his car was sandwiched in between two cars, and nobody would have even seen the van. It's so much smaller in person than you expect. Like when it's on the ground, it, I'm only six foot tall. It goes to the bottom of my chin. Like I could see completely over the roof, and it doesn't make sense when I say it, but it's a tiny. I have a two door Beamer is my daily, and it's a foot shorter in length. Oh yeah, they're, they're it's small. It's tiny. Yeah, it's tiny. So it ended up. Uh, Pete talked him into putting him in a, in a corner. You know, the building next to, you know, the AMBR cars and stuff like that. And it was, it was nuts. I had to do GNRS once. That was, yeah. that was a bucket list. For and, sure. And Definitely. And now, and then that, uh, so it, it won Best Van. <laughs> so, well, it's like such a mind fuck. Cause like, like one, it's like at the beginning of like when vans were still starting to pick up steam and, but also like people like see van and you assume that. The interior is going to be like crushed velvet diamond tuck or something. Yeah, and then you walk around. Or, right. Yeah. You walk around and the doors are open and it's like all this like polished wood that's like flawless. And it's just like. Yeah. What is it? What? Yeah, what? It was on crack. Which that's cool though, because that's, you know, that's like, that's the best thing about like art is like, it should make you stop and like consider and like what, like think about this and reflect on it, you know, not just like, oh, another, another car, another van, whatever, you know, like. Yeah. So the people, I kept going back. I mean, I was so proud just to have a car there. and um, But just to see the crowd around that van the whole time and to hear what people were saying. And, uh, I mean, I got to talk to some of my heroes there that I never would have talked to in a million years had it not been, you know, for that van. You know, because Steve Stanford is just a complete idol of mine. And, you know, he's sitting there and he's just like, this is the future. He's like, you're the future. And I'm like, oh, my God, you're you're killing me. So, and the emperors, I mean, they had the, um, that rest, I'm going to butcher, Frund. He had the, um, that lavender tea bucket that I think should have won the AMBR that year. Okay. With the white and the flathead that was yeah, all yeah, smooth yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, he can, he's like, this is my favorite car. I'm like, that's the favorite car. And <laughs> Harpoon had the, the, he had that car there that he painted with, um, Jimmy White at, uh, Circle City. 50, I mean, which was crazy. Yeah. Uh, just with love Pearl that Tape car. So cool. Love, love, love that car. And, um. I mean, it was, yeah, so, uh, but the coolest thing was, like, I didn't know, I didn't know that they gave um, additional awards, like, I thought that you get, like, a participation plaque, basically, and then, 
Um, but I guess they give awards for like best flathead, best paint, best whatever. And I'm like, I wonder if this thing could get best interior. I mean, yeah. I don't think, yeah, I don't think it was the right, uh, you know, the judges or whatever that was right for that. But um, it got the Chip Foose Excellence in Design Award. Hmm. And that to me is I worth millions more than the, as a than designer the too i mean like that's got to feel pretty fucking yeah. good and you know everybody involved i mean you know kevin you know kevin made it running and drivable and then steve rose i think is the other guy uh, that was working for him at the time and this is the last car they did i mean they huh. he he closed shop and became uh he started like um a custom oddly enough uh custom cabinetry place huh. and he didn't even do the woodwork in it and that place is gone and now he's he's super happy with uh you know a nine to five job which i'm trying to run from like the wind but, uh, <laughs> but he's super he's super happy and doing his stuff but you know he 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 gets the credit for for making it running and driving but he didn't paint it so he doesn't get that credit and then you know tim gets credit for doing what he did but he didn't make it running and driving so it's not tim's car either so it's really weird when you post photos online and people are like this is a tim Conner car and i'm like See, it is, partially it is, but you gotta give you gotta uh -huh. give love to the other guys so you gotta i mean i gotta I, I try so hard to make sure that everybody gets credit and that they know that i didn't build it but you know i help put this team together too so you produced it's a, it yeah, but it's a i mean i don't know i don't know who gets credit for it but it is and i love it and i drive the shit out of it so it's awesome i the thing i i connect with the most on that van is just, just like you were saying, the first issue of Church is that size because that's the resolution you could get. Like it just came together so naturally that every decision on that van comes from practicality. Like the the way the seats are in the interior, you can't do it any other way and have it make sense. It's so yeah. nothing is. You didn't set out to create this. Uh, you it even, doesn't look forced. It's not forced. You set out to create something functional and beautiful, and it. It works really, really well. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of drawers in the side where I can put stuff. There's, um, you know, it has uh, still kept the intention to sell at a show if I want to sell at a show. I have, like, little bookshelves where I can put my, my books on the side walls. It's so beautiful, the though. Rack, so the wine rack, yeah, 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 basically. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I think Piero from Mad Fabricators, uh, he says that he calls it my Ikea van. <laughs> how would you like put like i would be like tear like the interior is so beautiful like if you put like an easy up in there you're gonna like fuck it all up yeah, like actually, um the upholsterer uh the guy that reupholstered it he made like um a little thing that goes inside that like on the floor of it uh -huh. it's a really odd shape mm -hmm. and uh you know i took it out i took it out i think i had it in for one or two shows and then i took it out but it has these rods that go that go from the front of the back on the underside of like the headliner, uh -huh. and it 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 a it hides the seams from for the wood um, for for the headliner, and then I can also hang shirts on hangers in there, so it's almost like a little like a little art gallery in there, and then the back has like a a drawer that I can pull out and put um, prints in like flat like a flat file, and then that lifts up and it hides the gas stuff. So I mean all that stuff's hidden, but it's all it's all very. Very well thought out, very practical. So, I mean, it gets it gets good use. It gets good use. Then I had to put it to use. I mean, I drove it. It was 27 hours each way to go from L.A. to uh, Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, didn't trailer it. And had a little bit of carb trouble in New Mexico. And uh, I got pulled over going 90 in a 75 uh in the middle of texas was and, the cop just like like he just couldn't even handle <laughs> well, it i got i got behind from a group of people and um i was i was trying to catch up so i i just got i, I pulled over got gas and told my catch up so i caught up or almost caught up and then um yeah but the guy gave me a written warning but he was freaked out like he loved the van and uh he was freaked out that um he leaned on it like with his arms mm -hmm. and uh i had just had it changed over to AccuAir, and it's self-leveling, so when you put pressure on it, the van moved, and he, it kind of freaked him out, and I'm like, it's all good, no one's going anywhere, so he gave me a written warning, so I still have proof that it was going 90, um, but ironically, um, 
the speedometer, the speedometer said I was going 110. So now I know at least the differential. Of, you know, he may have just been much. being nice because I think anything over 90 is like yeah. a much bigger ticket. That, yeah, but people are like, oh, that van, you got to go, what, 60, 65? And I'm like, man, I can go 80 miles an hour all day on the freeway, hands off the wheel, straight as an arrow, no problems. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it'll, it'll get up and go. No smoky burnouts, but I mean, it, <laughs> it, it, it's highway geared and, and will go, so... So that was great. I mean, I, I was supposed to go with uh, my friend Dell. He was, uh, when, when co- going to Texas first came up, he was going to um, trailer the car to Wellington, Texas, to Flat Top Bob's place, which is the most spectacular house I've ever been to. And um, uh, he sent me a ton of parts for the van. So we were going to trailer the van there and then drive it from there in. So I wasn't a complete list, and that's like a seven-hour drive. Then like two weeks before... I think Dell realized like how much time he was going to be. It was going to be two weeks off of work, and he's so busy with his shop, he just couldn't do it. So he's like, "Look, fuck it, I can't, I can't do it. Yeah, I can't do it." And um, so Lucky Burton and Joe Creep were like, "We're driving. Like we got a modern car with a trailer full of stuff on the trailer, and uh, an old, an old kick-ass pickup truck, '58 truck, Ford, and um, we're driving out there with a SUV full of Aussies." It's like, why don't you come with us? I'm like, man, I don't want to be the guy that, that breaks down or whatever. He's like, we'll try it. We got a trailer. We'll move stuff into other cars. and uh, Do it. Whole, Do it. Yeah, never went on the trailer. It was... That's the best. It was the most rewarding trip I've ever... I've probably ever taken that van. People are so nice, too, between here and, and Texas. Like, just you meet people on the road, and they're just, like, nice and sincere. And, like, especially when you're driving something like like fun that speaks to them you know like yeah every gas station people are taking photos I yeah mean, it was it was absolutely absolutely crazy and then, of course like my my uh the credit card company that i'm with you know i'm like they're like are, are you in new mexico like, <laughs> like, your, your credit card's getting a lot farther away from your house so i just kept having to say hey i'm on a trip i'm fine it's all good or whatever so yeah all the way and then uh, we split like i think lucky Lucky had to go pick up a car that he was going to take back with, uh, take back with them to California for one of the Australian guys. So uh, myself and Joe uh, came back, and we had to do that in two days. So I think there was like a, like two fourteen hour days on those wood seats. <laughs> so I did buy a one inch thick, you know, piece of foam for that trip, and it's the only time I've used it. But usually, like uh, you know, Santa Maria is four hours. I've driven it there four times, five times. Four or five times, something like that. Get some memory foam pants. <laughs> yeah, I drove it. Yeah, I, I mean, I drove it to uh, San Jose for the good guys. I mean, for uh, the dead end thing. Yeah. And that, I mean, that was awesome. So yeah, it gets it's got some miles on it, and it's got you know I cracked the front glass coming back from Texas, and I got a bunch of rock chips in it now, and I'm 100 percent satisfied with it. Yeah, no, that's the that's the best. Yeah. Like when people build like these like beautiful show cars and they never ever get driven. Like that's one person's cup of tea. Good for them. More power to you. But fuck, that drive me personally yeah. crazy. Yeah. You know, like to just like have this thing and just possess it in your garage, and that's the extent of it. You know, like it drive yeah. me fucking nuts. Yeah, it's got you got to drive it. Got to drive it. What was that thing that you were talking about? The that um. The Japanese thing. Okay. You what? You wanted to, you wanted to talk about that. Yeah. Well, when I was doing research leading up to this podcast, I threw a Wikipedia tunnel. You know, you clip one thing, find one thing, one a little rabbit hole. I came across this uh, Japanese aesthetic idea called wabi sabi. Is it something you're familiar with? Mm-mm. Okay. Sounds familiar. But... So now, for anyone who's an expert, they're gonna groan at my explanation because <laughs> I learned about it like a few days ago. But there's this really awesome documentary. It's on YouTube. You Google Wabi Sabi, it's definitely worth a watch. It's this very Japanese idea. So Wabi Sabi, two words. Wabi is uh, like simplicity, and Sabi is like the inevitability of death. And so it's this Japanese idea of like taking... So Wabi, like you take away anything unnecessary, just get down to the fundamental thing, like a Zen garden, like a big pit of sand with a couple of rocks in it. It's all that it needs to be. And Sabi is... Like the idea that I don't know that that humans are going to die, and that inevitably you build a, be- a beautiful car and it's going to rust, it's going to fall apart, you're going to get chips in the paint, and so this idea in it's carried over in like Japanese architecture and like the way they lay out like monasteries and stuff like that. It's an appreciation and sort of celebration of the simple, 
and the the acknowledgement that you know, like the seasons change, so does everything else fall apart. Uh, like autumn is preparing for the death of winter. So I got into this big like philosophical whole like looking at church magazine of like when you take pictures of like yeah, a, a macro shot of like a drag store, you can see the chipping paint and the rust, and you're you're really it, it's wabi sabi. It's uh, as best as I can understand that term. Yeah, it sounds like it's something I should know a lot more about. <laughs> yeah, I'm into wabi sabi. So yeah, no, that sounds super cool. I'll definitely look that up when I get home. Is it does sound like that's kind of the the path I go on. I mean, I love like the old you know cracked paint and checked paint and uh, see what paint was underneath it or you know finding perfect lighting on an imperfect surface or rust or something like that. I mean, like uh, you know like the mercs that still have all the slice marks in it and stuff like like I like yeah. that kind of stuff instead of just taking pictures. Like I used to post a photo every day on Facebook, which was fine, um, but. I noticed that nobody was responding to the detail stuff that I love to take. They're like, I want to see the whole car. I'm like, I know what a 32 <laughs> Ford looks like. I, so I started just almost putting up uh, profile shots like mm-hmm. on that, and then I let that, that feed those people. And then, you know, I started, you know, that's when Instagram, you know, kind of got a hold of me, and I started on that with my phone photos. And that seems like it's more more up my alley. And, um, and the fact that it's square like my magazines do mm-hmm. is kind of, Kind of kind match of made in heaven, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But now, I don't know. I mean, it's a little stagnant, so I don't know. Well, uh, everyone's doing the Snapchat. Yeah, I don't know if that's for me. <laughs> I mean, I know it's the next generation. I don't know. I don't know if that's for me. But And I do think that, um, you know, with the, the – there's like a, like a fan base for church and the stuff that I do, and then there's a fan base for the van. But yeah. I'm not sure that that many people realize that they come from the same place. Like, I don't think they know it's the same. same Well, I mean, for all that you do, you are, you are pretty humble. Like, you're not, like, throwing it up in everybody's face, like, screaming, like, I'm Kobe from church and this is my van, you know? Like, where other people could be. I I deal with that with my art, too. It's like, I, I, in, even in my day job, like, hopefully the art speaks for itself. And then if they have questions or whatever, but you still get the, you know, Scooby-Doo and Marmaduke and, you know, it's, it's without. In, in simple nominative terms, you've made it very difficult to associate the two. Because when I Google church van, you're, you're the first thing that <laughs> yeah, comes yeah, out. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. But I think, like, there's certain, Man of mystery. There's certain codes, like, uh, that you, uh, certain things, I think, like, if you put, like, a... Uh, Econoline Van Gogh at mine kind of. I think there's one that actually has a Van Gogh painted on the side of the van or something. But, Cars um, not culture will get you to yeah, your yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Now it's church equipped, so I don't know if I'm going to take. I don't. I, I switched over to Shopify. It's a little more user friendly. Um, you know, it doesn't have so many subcategories. There's a little bit of a blog, which I don't write very much, but I, you know, I could post, you know, pictures from a trip or a couple of photos and a, a little short blurb about it so i try to put that up like every week but it's pretty new i mean there's only four or five of them up so but i do think i want to get rid of the other one because i'll get hey i tried to order some stuff and your site's down i'm like you're on the wrong site so but new st- yeah new stuff i think i just sent four new shirts to the printer a new belt buckle judas prius just because it makes me laugh but that's um new belt buckles basically done I, I want to do a bunch more prints. I have, like, an idea for, for some prints that uh, I, I really have to do. I'm just trying to figure out, like, the artists I want to work with to do it. And, uh, you know, I've got, like, a big list of, of things I want to do. And then we'll see, you know, that list fluctuates daily. And the ones that kind of rise to the top, they'll eventually get done. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk about any new car stuff going on, or do you want to keep that secret? Uh, no. Well, there's there's another car in the works. Um, it's another. I think the van was a left turn from where everybody was going before, and uh, like I had mentioned out out before this interview started, that um, I kind of shot myself in the foot with the van to where uh, I can't I can't just buy another car and and paint it and call it my car like. Like, people want to know what's next, so... 
people expect expect a something. More, a yeah. More, yeah. And something. For the longest time, I had that 64 Pontiac Bonneville, and I had big plans for that. I mean, I sat down with Stanford and told him what I wanted to do, and he whipped up a rendering, and it just never got done. So there was a reason it never got done, and I'm not exactly sure what that reason was. So um, I, I sold the car last year, and it went to Australia, and it's in really good hands. But I think that's going to be one that maybe I regret. So it's going to get you so by the brain banana. Yeah, yeah, that one. I mean, I. Th- but I have a big idea for for that car. That I mean, I have a name for it. I have a color palette for. It. I mean, I know like what mods are going to be done on it. Like that car is done in my head. Yeah, you it's built just, it. I need. You know, I I'm, I don't have the garage space, and I just can't have a ton of cars unless something miraculous happens. So, um, so yeah, so I'm going to go back to my drag roots. Like, uh, my dad was a, a flag starter at Fremont Drag Strip between like 1962, 1964. And, um, he quit and went drag racing and, um, you know, he bought a top fuel car. Uh, he was most successful in top, uh, top gas dragster. So, um, he had a, a really kick-ass long 210 inch, uh, Pete Ogden chassis car with uh, an injected Hemi and um, full Hageman body on it. I mean, it was a, a just a gorgeous car, and I know where it is, but um, the guy the guy won't sell it, so that, that's got to come back home eventually. That's on my list. But uh, So I'm kind of going back to drag racing routes, and uh, it's odd to say this now. I mean, the car's... I mean, it's, I get, get, getting close to being done. Not really close, but close. Um, but the more that I, the more that gets done on this car, the more I realize I'm a custom guy. Yeah. So I got to do the hot rod. It's going to piss some people off. Um, it, it's definitely going to ruffle some feathers. It's not going in a direction that, that a lot of guys are going. So there could be a lot of hate coming my way. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's pretty crazy and I, I can't wait. So maybe Grand Nationals would be, but it's, yeah, it's. Drag inspired raw magnesium, no, not a, not a bunch of polish and stuff like that. Uh, still, still trying to figure out between a couple of paint jobs that will both be a little alarming, I'm sure. And uh, yeah, it's got some attitude, so we'll see how it goes. But it should be st- a streetable drag car in theory. I don't think it's really legal. <laughs> some of the stuff that's being done, but um, you know, until I get pulled over, we'll deal with that then. I right. Guess. So, but I don't think, I know, it's not a car I'm driving to Texas. It'll be wild. I'll, I'll tell you that. It'll, yeah, it'll get attention, good or bad. I know that. And Tim Condor's, Tim Condor's on the case. I saw it this weekend, and it's, it's an eyeful. I, I don't, I don't, yeah, I can't even explain it. It's, so, he posts a couple of sneak peeks every once in a while on his, on his Facebook page. But I've kind of, you know, I, I've kind of told him not to show not, not too to much. Show too much. Yeah, yeah, don't give it away. Not to show too much. But you can kind of see the engine, and you kind of see you see that it's set back, and you can see the raw mag, and uh, you know there's no paint and stuff like that. There's no interior yet. And um, I told him that you know once once that point comes, to just don't give away too much and leave a little bit for. I don't even know if you need to debut a car. I mean, I wanted to do it once, and it was the van. So if it gets to the Grand Nationals and debuts there, great. If I don't debut it and it just shows up at a show, great. Like I don't at this point, I want to. To make sure that I help I, on this one, Tim Tim has done so much of the car. Like I had a general, this is what I want to do, and then uh, my mom passed in January, so the car kind of fell off of my priority list a little bit. And uh, so I let Tim Tim run with this car probably more than I normally would, but um, we're on the same page as far as style and stuff and stuff like that. So. Uh, he, he's the right guy for this job, and uh, if he wants to debut it at the Grand Nationals, then that's where I want it out. I want it, you know, whatever it takes to help uh, help him a little bit that can maybe get him a little publicity, then I want to make sure that that's what happens. That'd be the show, dude. Yeah. That'd be the show, you know? Yeah, yeah. For I mean, sure. I think that would be a good one. I mean, I can't really think. I mean, L.A. Roadster show would be cool to drive it to, but it's not really a debut place, but yeah. um, I really don't know. There's not much left besides Pomona. I mean, no, I mean, there's the Grand Nationals and Japan. Those are the yeah. two places I would love to debut a car. Yeah. And, and Logistically, Japan, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, they have to agree to it. And, right. I mean, and it's... Help you I mean, ship it over. Know, but they have to know, you know, probably in March or April. Yeah. yeah. 
when they make their decisions, and I know they've already been made for this year, so even if, I mean, it would have to be finished. I think they ship it like, um, like October or something. It's gotta it, be fucking yeah, terrifying. It takes like six weeks. Oh, yeah. It takes six weeks to get over there and like four weeks or something like that to come back. I can't imagine. So. It's so much trust. Yeah, I mean, shipping. the Starlight guys went, when I was there, the Starlight guys were there, and I mean, that was awesome to see their stuff driving on, on streets in Japan. I mean, it yeah. was just, uh, I've been twice now and I, uh. That place is like second home. What else you got? I don't know. I, I think we pretty much covered everything I wanted to, to talk about. Is there anything else that you wanted to? Um. Well, the there's the toy. Yeah. The yeah. Toy oh yeah. Out. For sure. Yeah. So that um that was done by uh, it was basically spearheaded by Sean Taylor and Two Machines, and uh, they do it's like a Hot Wheels size one sixty fourth, but they put in a crazy amount of detail. And talked to him, like, wait, like, five years ago, probably after the band came out, and they had just, I believe they just licensed uh, the Econoline, because mm-hmm. uh, they have to pay for it or whatever for that kind of stuff. So they knew they were going to do a van, and then I kind of talked him into, you know, what if we do, is it possible to do a Van a Van Gogh version, where we just take the, the van that they do, put it on another chassis, paint it green, and um, that's it, and... Uh, you know, is that something where if I pay, can we do that? And then I'll just buy however 200, 500, that, like whatever, mm-hmm. you know, I'd make it, you know, so that doesn't come out of your guys' pocket. It would just be the same old. And uh, so that was the initial plan and in that they were going to uh, come out with their vans. Uh, they released them in a couple of stores like Walmart and Meyer, I think is like back east or something like that. And uh they were going to do a bunch of different color variations, and uh, I mean, it wouldn't say Van Gogh or anything on it, and I told them they could use my exact paint job um, if they wanted to, to release that, on, on that they could do their make their money on it, and uh, but, you know, they would have to use, you know, do golds or reds or blues or something like that, but if it was a green, a green one that looked like mine, I get all of That was the deal. And over the years, the deal changed several times, and I think it probably got shelved, and then the company got sold, and there was kind of a, a bunch of stuff that happened in the middle. But they ended up doing something that they've never done, and they did three versions of the van. So there's the basically a stock white Econo line that's been lowered. So it has the stock body lines, you know, the gas tanks where it's supposed to be, the license plates where it's supposed to be. It's got the stock tail lights, it's got the stock bumper, stock interior, stock everything. And that's basically how I got the van, uh, with the exception of it being lowered. Then the second one is right before the van was painted. So it's primer gray, but it has everything that's been customized. It, they got rid of the door hinges. They got rid of the gas tank, the, the license plates backwards, you know, where it is now instead of in the door. You know, it's got the, the Pontiac taillights. It's got the split bumpers. It's got the no, um, you know, no torn signals in the, in the front. I mean, it's and amazing it how too, much, yeah. it's amazing how much detail they packed into a 164th. And it has my interior in it. Like, if you take it apart, it has my engine cover. It has the mm-hmm. wine rack in the door. It has <laughs> the flatbed in the back. It has where my AC is, even though it's not hooked up. It has that. It has my seats. It ha- it's, it's unbelievable. And then the last one is fully painted like my van. And then they came out with a chase car. So I, I guess is what they did. And they did custom packaging, too, which they've never done before. So... Uh, so you, you have to buy them, you had to pre-order them through them, and they they put 48 in a, what they call a master case. So a master case will come with uh, 15, actually it's supposed to be 16 white ones, 16 primer ones, 16 green ones, and they pull out one white one, and they put in a chase car, and that's like the super rare one. So most of the hobby shops will buy a case, a master case, just for that one car, and practically give the other stuff away. Mm-hmm. So I was able... Just like the hobby shops, I think they had like a, there's like a hundred and maybe a hundred and twenty five or hundred and fifty cases total ever that will ever get done. So they let me buy the cases like they did, and then um, me alone, they let buy full cases of forty eight of just the green version because I think that's what the people that know the van will want. So I loaded up. I probably bought twenty percent of all the cars that were made, and. Uh, I learned right away that there's a big difference between diecast car collectors and people that know the van. Yeah. So, because the diecast guys, they want the newest thing that comes out, and then two weeks later, it's a, it's in a shelf on a you know put away, and they're after the next thing. Hmm. Where, you know, I haven't even been to a show with the van with the car, which I think is just gonna you know I'll I'll be able to sell a bunch, bunch that way. So yeah, but that was a long, 
a long wait, but the detail in that band is so, so amazing. Yeah, they turned out really so cool. Amazing. Yeah. And the packaging, too, is like... Yeah. Like, really, yeah. really interesting, really smart. Yeah. And smart I was packaging. I expecting them to do, like, church branding. I mean, it has, like, a, they took the thing I had on my old site that talks about, like, church is the merging of Kobe's two greatest passions, design and cars and whatever. Like, they put that on the back. They put the church logo. They put the Van Gogh logo on there. I mean, they put the website on. I don't even remember if it's the new website or the old one. But, I mean, they went above and beyond. And, I mean, to do three cars, it's it's crazy. The, the van has just taken on a life of its own, so I certainly can't complain. Well, maybe if you, you you take the van and take the toys to the next show, sell a bunch of them, and do another magazine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the van, yeah, the magazine, I mean, this the next issue is number 10. Um, I actually saved copies. I, I saved, I hand number them all. I saved number one through 250 of every issue. So... I plan on doing like a Ten Commandments, so you could buy, you can buy a matching. You'll be able to buy a matching numbered box set of all all ten issues, but you get number sixty four or whatever it is. So that will eventually be coming. It'll come with a shirt and a box and a whatever. And I, I haven't really figured that out completely. And then you can still buy most of I think like four or five or four through nine. You can still buy individual ones. And um, but there'll be others. Yeah, there's definitely going to be more stuff coming up. I want to really kick ass, sink my teeth into it, and, um, you know, do stuff to make my mom proud. She was my biggest fan, so now that's kind of the mission is, yeah, I gotta do stuff, I gotta do it, I, I mean. It's okay, too, like, something, something major like that happens, and you gotta, like, take a minute to catch your breath, and. Yeah, and I'm not gonna get any younger, so this year, basically, not because of her, but was like, you know what, I need to cross something off the bucket list, so, um, I went to the Indy 500, and I, own, I my my younger brother works uh, for Andretti, so he he does uh, he builds the shocks for all the Andretti cars, uh-huh. and uh, so they they qualified five cars for the Indy 500, and uh, they won a couple years ago with Ryan Hunter Ray, and um, they won again this year. So mom was there. You know he got his second, you know he's gonna get his second Indy 500 win uh, ring, and it was for the hundredth running i went back to uh um pennsylvania for the jalopy showdown and i'd uh, i'd met scary larry ages ago on the salt flats and he puts on the jalopy showdown and they race these old cars in the mud and it's something i've always wanted to go see but it's the week before paso or santa maria so i could never go and uh this year i'm like you know what i'm gonna set out santa maria no offense to penny i'll be back next year and uh so I think I put almost 2,500 miles on a rental car in two weeks, just driving everywhere. I mean, I saw a ton of shops and went to a couple of shows and then the Indy. I mean, it was it was amazing. It was amazing. So back and ready to start hammering. Stuff's coming. Stuff's coming. Like it or not. <laughs> but we're, we're like an hour and a half. It's... Yeah. Whatever you want. Whatever you want. If you find out some more stuff, I'll come back. I... <laughs> I imagine you're going to be back and forth checking on the car a little more often. Yeah, uh, I checked up on the van a lot, like, uh, near the end and coming up and just making sure that things were on pace because the deadline was coming up. And, I mean, we thrashed. We duct taped the, you know, we duct taped the glove box in the van. And yeah. and then when I left, it was raining when the when the Grand Nationals closed. They, they make you out. You have to get out that night. And, right. uh, I mean, it was raining, and I had never driven the van before. And they're like, you got to drive it out. Like, you can't bring a trailer in, so... I mean, up the hill, down the hill, in the yeah. back, and it's a long. Don't know if it's going to stop. Yeah, don't know if it's going to stop going down the hill or whatever. Or the brakes are going to work, and uh, but it was fine. And uh, so, um, so that, yeah, that one, that one was cutting it by the skin of our teeth. This one, I'm trying to get a little earlier because I know that the upholsterer I want to use, um, he gets backed up right before, right before the Grand Nationals. So I'd love to give him a little extra time, and then maybe we can finesse some bugs later. And I'm going to try to come up here. Uh, I'll try to come up in July and and in August and hopefully get the car super early September and uh, get it home and uh, hope for the best. Hope yeah. for the best. I can't wait to see it. It's so it's gonna be a good one. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know. I don't know if I should laugh or cry, but uh, yeah, it'll be. People will talk. It'll be fine. Good. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very yeah. much. Oh no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you're doing this. Thanks. Someone's got to do it. The one thing I did forget, though, which we can, we can leave out of the whole thing, but I do want it on tape because it makes me laugh, 
was um, <laughs> when the first magazine came out. I told you guys before, but is it the with Roger's Journal? Is that um, on tape? Uh, no. Uh. Okay, so um, so when the first issue of the magazine came out, um, it was like a big achievement. I did it on my own with no advertising, um, crappy photography from my little camera, but um, I was super proud of it. So I think I was at the, I think I was at the L.A. Roadster show, and I saw Steve Coonan. Uh, from Rotter's Journal, and it's like my favorite magazine in the world, and it's just a head and shoulders above, above everything else. Um, so, any I, I see him, and I'm like, I'm gonna give him one of my magazines. So I go up to him and I introduce myself, and I said, Hey, Steve, my name's Kobe, but um, you don't know who I am. But I just made this little magazine, and I wanted, I'm really proud of it. I want to make sure that you get one, and. Uh, he starts flipping through it, and it, you got to realize, this thing's it's tiny. It, there's no way in hell that this is going to compete with Rotter's Journal. And the first one's folded and stable. It's not oh, bound yeah, like yeah, the yeah, other yeah. This may be like it's, four by four. It, it's five by five, 52 page. You could put it in your pocket, basically. Yeah. Or it's a coaster. It's basically a coaster. <laughs> Smaller than so, a new iPhone. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so Steve flips through it, and he says, um, what kind of camera are you using? And I'm like, oh, I use a little pocket digital. And he goes... I don't shoot digital. And he hands the book back to me. I was completely defeated. So, um, but, you know, get back on the horse. So I, I make the second one. And uh, it, this one has my brother's photography. So the photography is a lot better. The It's got more pages, 80 pages. It's six inches by six inches. So it's a little bigger. Um, it's still stapled. So it gets a, a hair dog-eared. Um, but I could not be more proud of this magazine. And uh, he's at the Grand National Roaster Show. And I see him polishing some Halibrands. So, of course, I go up to him again like an idiot, and I say, I don't think you know who I am, but I make this little magazine. I know who you are. And I go, well, I got another issue out, and I wanted to give you one. So he starts flipping through it, and he says, must be nice not to have to write articles. <laughs> so after that, I stopped showing him magazines. But the, um, the crazy thing is, is about uh, six months later, Mike Lavella, he did an article for Rotter's Journal mm-hmm. on the top, I think it was the top 10 self-published automotive magazines in the country or wherever, mm-hmm. and uh, Church was in it. Right. So for somebody who I'm assuming is just socially awkward, um, I guess he respected enough to put it in there, so thank him for that. That's cool. But yeah, that's about all I can think of. <laughs> I remember the, the Rob Fortier thing came full circle, too. Uh, we, yeah, so yeah, the yeah, first yeah. half of that. But you, you ended up talking to him again about the van after it was finished, Yeah, right? well, that was the funny part, because <laughs> um, cause it's not a rod or it's not a custom. But right. by the time the van came to Grand National Roaster Show, um, he was the editor of Rod and Custom. And he's, he mentioned, hey, the van came out bitching. I want to I wanna put it in the magazine. And I'm like, well, it's not a rod or it's not a custom. It's in no man's land. So I got a touche from him <laughs> and a chuckle from Cole Foster. And uh, at that, by that point, I had already promised uh, Zombie from Rod and Culture. He, um, he was a big supporter of the van probably 18 months or a year before it came out. Yes. He said he wanted it. He guaranteed that uh, it was going to get X amount of pages that uh, my brother was shooting for him, that my brother would be able to photograph it and um, it would get the cover. So, and I, it, just as a person and as a magazine, like, um, I love his paper, the paper quality, the ad content is a lot less than some of the other magazines. So, I mean, there's a few reasons why I went with, uh, went with Zombie, but, um, I mean, obviously I would have, uh, and Zombie would have said the exact same thing, that um, if Rotter's Journal would have wanted the van, that's where the van goes. And Tim Condor had this pipe dream that the van was going to get into uh, into Rotter's Journal, and he knows that they either you know they shoot it head on, mm-hmm. got the roll of paper in the front to make it you know hide, and they put it up on jacks and all his little secret tricks that I just gave away. <laughs> but um, on the headlight bezels on the van, Tim welded them shut, mm-hmm. so you can't. There are no there's no screw holes for the headlight bezels, and he mounted them from the inside. And I didn't even know like that was that didn't come from me. That comes from Tim. But he's like, just in case. He's like, I didn't want to have the Phillips head screw holes that were not all clocked the mm-hmm. same or you could see them. So he just, oh, Lord. He just got rid of them. Then that was yeah. just a decision he wanted to make just in case. So 
there's Tim Condor for you. That's, That's a funny. level of finish that is like yeah. beyond me. Yeah. But you can still see, you know, that the car is, you know, there's there's imperfections on, you know, whether it's the cooling, you know, that the engine cover is a little tighter than it should have been and it would be nice to have a little more air to it. It, it doesn't overheat. It rarely overheats, but, it, you know, it's possible. I haven't taken over the grapevine yet, but, um, you know, there's little imperfections and with the, the chip and the glass and stuff like that now, but it's because it's driven. So cool. I'm, I'm good with that. Oh, the one other thing that I didn't mention, and uh, it, it might not even be appropriate, but I've had this discussion with multiple people and uh, that, that I respect greatly, and um, I, I, I'm a, I don't even know why I have to sell it, but um, I'm not an artist. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's like getting my hands dirty or whatever, but um, like when I said that I used to go to these art shows and I would buy art from a Dennis McPhail or a Pete or a Pete. Um, a Von Franco or a mm -hmm. Keith Wiesner or Ed Roth or whoever, um, like those guys are artists. You're like they're in the trenches, they're dirty and, and stuff like that. And uh, I'm not that guy. I'm a I'm a designer, and right. I I I think that that comes through with the work that I do and the and the the cars and the vans and the design of that stuff. But um, it's just this weird conversation that I've had with a few people that they're like, "Well, you're an artist." I'm like, "I'm a designer. You're an artist. I'm a designer." So. <laughs> Gonna stick up for the design geeks every once in a while. Yeah, I, I so I'm a mechanical engineer, so I do a lot of design work. Of course, a very, very different school of design, but uh, yeah, I, I consider myself on the design side of the argument yeah. too. Like we we touched on a little bit in the interview with Billy about like that our cars art or are they is it design or is it art? And he is on the art side, right, 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 because he's smarter <laughs> than all of us. Um, I always say design like a, a car is not art it is function it, it must get from point a to point b otherwise it's not a car you could build art from a car you right. can have artistic elements to a car but it must function yeah so and i noticed they said they were talking about you know like uh oh it's got to be era specific and it has to be this every part is from 19 blah 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 like to me and it must be the designer in me. It's a, a, a cool car is a cool car. It, and it could be a Honda or it could be a motorcycle, a scooter. It could be, like, I don't care what it is, but a cool car is a cool car. If, like, the first, if, you know, if the proportions are on and the color is right and the materials used are cool and it's not, like, it, it's not specifically a, hey, look at me, then... I think it's a. I think it's a successful creation. I think pigeonholing yourself like that too is is a little short sighted because something could come come about that's not easy to put in a particular category, but it's still an awesome car, you know. So like yeah. saying well, that, I never, like I never thought the I never thought I'd have a car with wooden interior. I yeah. can tell you that. Right. But it, right. I mean, that came from architecture. It didn't come from the car world. But if, if you know Tim or myself hadn't you know looked outside of just rolls and pleats or bomber seats or right you know mexican yeah. blankets then I, that wouldn't have so happened many people, so many people like is that the van with the wood interior or you got to see the interior the inside is just as nice as the outside like yeah. that all comes up because of that and had it not been that i mean maybe it would have just been another van like maybe not but i mean it's it's a whole whole new aspect of that thing that never would have happened and it's good to like push those those boundaries and such because that's how you know innovation happens and that's how like new things come to be. I mean like there at one point someone was the first person to cut the roof off of the car and yeah. put it back yeah. and like make it lower. And let people push back, you know? Like if they I'm don't like it they yeah. can push back and that's fine. I mean, I get the whole um well, I like this van better than that van because I'll never get to see that van in person or because you're just like it's like the stupidest <laughs> reasons you're like well, welcome it's not to the internet though <laughs> yeah it's not a competition like this one's for me if you don't like it it's for me i don't care like, yeah your car if i don't like it like that's cool i can still take a nice picture of it hopefully maybe it's like in music like you could debate like rolling stones versus the beatles you don't have to pick you can, you don't have to. You can like them both you can like the clash and the sex pistols yeah but wait yeah. seriously the rolling stones are better than the beatles <laughs> well like, sure but but what the, but the white album's really good i go zombies but yeah. yes 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 so yeah it's not all day though but everyone somebody's got a you know, they always have to stir the pot where I don't like it, or so and so was first, or well, opinions are like assholes, right? Here's an here's an imperfection. I was like, well, like what have you done? Like yeah. let's let's go look at your. Mm -hmm. Oh, you didn't drive one in. 
Yeah. Yeah, so. We should wrap this up. Yeah. Game over. Well, all right. That's the end. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I want to thank Kobe for taking the time out to sit down and talk with us. I had a great time, and I really learned a lot. Uh, I also want to thank Josie, for my wife, for joining in on the interview. Uh, thanks for contributing so much to this and helping steer the conversation. Also, a huge thank you to Mike at Wildwood Studios in Berkeley. Uh, thank you so much for the space. You have an awesome studio and a really cool uh, little vintage store out front. So that's it. That's all I got. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you want to give something back to the show, it would be very helpful if you could help spread the word by telling a friend or writing a review on iTunes. That helps give us a little bit more visibility online. Until next time, this is Nick signing off. Thank you.